Oh, no, I, was, I wasn't drafted. I was an enlistee. So you enlisted? Yes. Where were you living at the time? In uh, 14 Harbison Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. Do you recall the date? Uh, my mother wanted me to stay home for Christmas, so then I went down the day after Christmas to uh, enlist. Um, how old were you at that time? 17. So your parents had to sign for you then? Yeah, my, fa yeah my father signed for me. He agreed to sign? Yeah. I was I was going to sign his name, but he had a he had a different way of making it. He all swirls and everything. I couldn't copy it. You know, I was going to I was going to sign his name when I was sixteen. <laughs> wow. I'll be gone. I mean, I mean, that's it. Yeah. In what branch of the service did you enlist? United States Navy. Why did you choose the Navy? I like the Navy. Why? Uh, I wanted to go all the different places. I wanted to fight the Japs because they killed a lot of Americans. I was happy to fight them. <coughs> I, I'm sorry. That's a, do you recall your first days in service? Where did you go right after you were inducted? Sampson, New York. I, 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 that was the name of the, where the, <coughs> that wasn't the city. It was, that was the base to, for the re recruits. And is that where you did your basic training? Yes, four weeks. That's all they gave us. Four weeks? That's all, yeah. What was basic training like? Zero degrees temperature. It was cold up there. What kinds of things did they teach you? Not much. Not much at all. Supposedly looking for spies out in the zero, to five, ten below zero. There are no spies up there. You know, they don't know what to do with you, I guess. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? Mm -hmm. Did they teach you physical things or did they teach you classroom? They, <coughs> they didn't teach us much. They, uh, <coughs> we went running five miles on the highway and, and I, I think they, they also, they had us jump off about a 30 foot um, platform into the water. And I didn't like that because by the time I got to the bottom, my legs were like, yeah, I, 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 know, I, I couldn't jump with my legs. Uh, that was, in case you had a band and shift, you know, if it, we got sunk, it was like 30 feet high off of a platform. And, uh, and then they decided to send me to radio school in uh, uh, Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. Right, so um, how long did you stay at radio school? Five months. And did I told them I wanted to, go on a ship and, and start fighting and they told me there's two ways you're going to you're going to get out of here you're either going to graduate from the radio school or you're going to go to Portsmouth Naval Prison up in New Hampshire I said oh gee I want my mother to send me <laughs> up in the prison they were mean and ornery really did you did you want to become a radio operator or did the Navy choose that for you I think they chose it for me so what did they teach you what do you recall about your radio training well, it lasted five months, and uh, I'll see what else. <coughs> what kind of radios did you have to learn? Uh, the code, dot, 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 like SOS, did, 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 did. So you had S to learn the whole Morse code? Yes, yes. What were the duties of a radio operator? Um, you, send, you send messages and you receive them. So you, you figured you were going to be put on a ship, yeah. and you would be a radio operator on yeah. a ship? Yes. Did you know you'd be going overseas? You wanted to go oh, overseas. Oh yeah, yeah. I wanted to go. Be, I wanted to cut out the radio school and go then. They wouldn't let me. I, I told myself, I want to go out and fight. And that's what I joined for. And they says, there's what, there's two ways you're going to get out of here. You're going to either go to Portsmouth Naval Prison in New Hampshire, or you're going to graduate from the radio school. So you graduated from the radio <laughs> school. <laughs> After you graduated from radio school, where did you go? I went to, let's see, Solomon's Island, Maryland, Amphibious. I wanted to get on a destroyer, but they, they wanted to get rid of all, I didn't want am, Amphibious, it was in Solomon's so Island. So this was Amphibious training? Yeah. So describe that to me, what was that like? Oh, <coughs> we, I think we took the Marines and the Army on a, you know, on a, on, on a ship. And then we'd go up on the beach and they're supposed to climb out of the ramp and so forth. 
I think we took them to Virginia. What kind of a ship did you use? Were you trained on? It, was, it wasn't our ship. I, uh, it was, um, uh, I guess it was just a training ship. But it wasn't a destroyer. What was oh, it? Was no, it an no. LST? I don't think it was an LST. I think it was an LC landing, landing craft infantry. <coughs> like um, it had, uh, like here's the ship, and then on either side, they had like ramps going down to the ocean so the soldiers and marines could get off. And you, you go up on the beach and they could run down the ramp and go up and, you know, and lay down on the ground so they wouldn't get killed. So in the amphibious training, was your job the radio operator or did you have a different job? Um, so long ago I forget. But on our own ship, uh, I asked to be on one of the guns, so I was a, like a loader on a 20 millimeter gun. Then, then I wanted to be on the 50 caliber machine gun, so I was on a 50 caliber machine gun. When you were in Maryland, how long were you training for the amphibious? See, uh, I, I think we were there at least five or six months. Oh, so that was quite a, a lengthy time. Did you yeah. did you know that you were being trained to go to the Pacific? Yes, because. Uh, the, 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 the ships that we trained on had all the painting for the Pacific. And the ones going over to Europe had just one, one coat of paint. You know, and I knew that wasn't for us. Ours was the <laughs> over around the Pacific with the Japanese. After your amphibious training, where did you go? Down to New Orleans. And what did you do there? <coughs> we uh, we uh, picked up our ship down there at, at Algiers, which is the other side of New Orleans, across the Mississippi River. Did did you travel with? Was your whole unit that you say you picked up your ship? The whole yeah. unit that manned that ship were you yeah. all at Maryland together? Did you train? I, I together? don't know if we were all at Mar Maryland or not because I don't think the cook had to be there. No, but the the core crew was there. I you think so. Together? Yeah. Then you went to Algiers together? Yeah. And what ship did you pick up? A brand new one, the LCT 1397. LCT 1397, yeah. and LCT stands for what? Landing Craft, um, LC, landing, LC Landing Craft Tank. Can you tell me anything about an LCT, how, how big it is, and what it, purpose does it serve? It's 110 feet long, about 50 feet wide, and uh, let's see what else. <coughs> so, so they put they put uh, two 20 millimeters guns on it, and then and then when we got to Pearl Harbor, we got two 50 caliber machine guns. So we only had four guns, 20, 20 millimeter. And, uh, How many men does it hold? <coughs> uh, the crew. Yeah. About 17 men and two officers. Oh, so it's pretty small. It is. Yeah, very small. What was your job on the LCT? Um, actually, it was everything. We'd steer it, we'd uh, drop the anchor, we'd pull the anchor. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't pull the anchor up. It was, um, uh, I, I think, it must have been somehow connect, connected up uh, with a win winch or something like that. So the entire crew had to know how to operate yes, and yes, run the whole everything. ship? Yes. Um, how long did you stay in Algiers? Just long enough to pick up your ship, or were you stationed there for any length of time? I, I think we must have been there <coughs> maybe two months. I think that might have been. And what did you do in your time there? Is that what you learned the ship? Uh, and then they sent us for more gunnery uh, off of, not in New Orleans itself, about maybe 60 miles away. And uh, <coughs> we had more training on the, on the guns. You had more training on the guns? Yeah. Had you had any previous training, in basic training or in amphibious training on shooting the guns? Um, we had training on the 45 caliber of pistols, and then we had training on the, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we shot any before that, like that. <coughs> we had two 20 millimeter guns on the LCT, and we had two, <coughs> we didn't, they, they didn't put the two uh, 50 caliber machine guns till we got to Pearl Harbor. When you were in Algiers, is that when you learned how to fire the 20 millimeter gun? Probably. 
I, I, I think I wasn't exactly there. I think it was at Lake Poncha Train. I think that's what it was. Where did you learn how to fire the 50 caliber machine gun? <coughs> they, they, they didn't. They didn't tell, tell us hardly anything. We had a, a gunner's mate, and, and he and he, um, he knew everything about guns. He, he, and he, he, in fact, he shot down. He saved us, everybody our life because this uh, Japanese kamikaze. You know they have a thousand pound bomb in front, and they, what they do is they, they don't care that they're going to get killed themselves. They just smash into you and blows up the thousand pound bomb and it sinks your ship and it kills you. Just about everybody else. So how did that gunner's mate save you? <coughs> well, the, the, um, they, were, they were attacked us night and day, all night long. We didn't get any sleep, and all day long. But the, the one that was the worst one was he—he he was coming in uh, the you know, Japanese uh, kamikaze about about four feet over the ocean, and aiming right toward us because we were tied up to an ammunition ship. So so if he blew up us. We would have blown up the ammunition ship, and and they always gave, it was the job of unloading ammunition ships. Like we load 262 ton. That's 262 1,000 pound bombs. So it's, each one was a ton apiece, and they always had us do that. So, anyways, we were tied up to the ammunition ship, and this kamikaze is coming right at us. I, I was up in the radio uh, tower, and I, I said, "There's no way that." Uh, you know, they're kind of tricky, the Japanese, too. They'll, 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 they'll go in front of another American plane or something like that. But anyways, he just stood at the gun and, and he just, he killed him from, he says he thinks he killed the pilot like from here to that uh, house or whatever. And I said, he, he was a good gunner's mate. Wow. And where was this incident? Where, did, where were you located when that happened? Let me think. Oh, boy. I think it had to be Okinawa, <laughs> because we were always unloading uh, uh, ammunition ships and bringing the, uh, the 262 ton of bombs. So, and they went up with B-29s and, and bombed Japan, the, the pilots did. All right, so after um, you picked up your LCT in Algiers, where did you go? Uh, <coughs> we picked, uh, let's see, let me think. I know we went around through the Panama Canal and up the coast of Mexico to San Pedro, California. So and you had your whole crew on board by then. You picked up your whole crew in yeah. New York, and then you went through the Panama Canal. Yeah. Um, how long did you stay in California? Um, <clears throat> probably, probably a month, maybe, maybe less. Probably a month. And then how did you get to the Pacific? Cause the LCT was too small to cross the ocean, wasn't they it? Kept, they, they picked it up with a big winch and put it on top of a, uh, another uh, LST. So... They picked it up. Do you know which LST? I think it was 833. And then the LST crossed the ocean yeah. with your little LCT on board? Yes. How long did it take you to get over to the Pacific? <coughs> oh, we, we stopped at the Pearl Harbor. Oh, so you stopped at Pearl Harbor. Which is Honolulu, is right there. Yep. So. What did you do in Pearl Harbor? Just refueling? I think so. And then, then they put the machine guns on, I think, for us. They did had a weld them on. Yeah, did you, at Pearl, did you have a chance to get off the boat at all and see? Yeah. Um, I walked around Honolulu. And my friend, he was in the Navy. Uh, Pop Murray. He was our 38. Everybody called him Pop. <laughs> he was 38. He was an old man, 38. And, and so I walked all around Havu, and, and who do I bump into him? He's already drunk, you know. So he says, Sorry, I'm going to take you up and get you a milkshake. I says, They don't have milkshakes in a bar. He says, This bar does. I says, Gee, maybe he's right, you know. And, uh, so I went with him up there. And, and, and the bouncer, they always have a bouncer in all the bars to knock out all the drunk sailors, you know. And, and, and so, so, so the, the bouncer put his arm across like that, and my friend popped, I forget his last name. I, anyways, he says to the bouncer, he said, I see somebody tagged you already. He had a black eye, <laughs> and the bouncer, someone says, <laughs> and he says, when he socks somebody, he says he runs like 60 down the ramp and, 
<laughs> so they won't catch him. Pop Murray. Uh, he's in the Navy 16 years and he only got like one promotion and it was temporary because he's always, you know, drunk and fighting the shore. The shore patrol always brought him back. So did you get your milkshake? <laughs> no. They, didn't they, have don't, they don't have an bar. <laughs> <laughs> he told me they did, but they didn't. Uh, did you, while you were at Pearl, did you see the damage from the bombing? Did you see yeah, the well, I, I saw Arizona? I, 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 uh, the, the oil was still coming up from that. Okay, because those uh, ships have a lot of oil that they carry that was still coming up there, and, and uh, bubbles and everything. And, and uh, I think there was about two or three thousand guys that were on there to kill. So we were right next to it so that we could see it. But I didn't have a camera. I wish I brought a camera. All right, in that they loaded two fifty caliber machine guns. Yeah. Um, did you have any practice there at Pearl in how to no. handle those? Mm -mm. So how did you learn how to, to fire a 50 caliber? Well, the gunner's mate that we had on the ship, he had one gunner's mate, and he knew everything about guns. So he taught the rest of you? Yeah, but not, not, he didn't have time to do it, <coughs> you know, but it was okay. What was your assigned job aboard the LCT? I was supposed to be the radio man. Were, was there only one radio operator? Yeah, that was me. And did you do that? I did that. And then I taught the other people how to do uh, just simple things. They, they didn't use it. They, they, I think even they don't do the code anymore. You know the, the Morris code. Is that what they call it, Morris yeah. code? Do you remember how to do it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. They don't use that anymore. Um, when you left Pearl. Did they load your LCT on another boat, or did you, at that point, did you take off on your own? I think they did load us on it. On the, on the, on the, um, it might have been the same one that brought us to Pearl Harbor, the 833. And then where did you go? Uh, Guadalcanal. Oh, so you went right from Pearl to Guadalcanal? Yeah. Had the battle already? Oh, yeah, I didn't have nothing to do with that battle. So the battle was over. So tell me about Guadalcanal and what it was like there, and what you did. <coughs> Well, the, the natives would bring out pineapples, trying to sell them to you for about five dollars, and uh, they had they dyed their hair. Some a lot of the natives, <laughs> they just wanted money from us. Now they come out to the ship to try to sell you a pineapple or something like that. What was your duty at Guadalcanal? What did your LCT do? I, I think we uh, took the Marines on a, a what would you call it? A, uh, I, I can't think of the word it is. <coughs> Take them to uh, different islands, and we uh, run our ship up on the beach, and they would, you know, go down the ramp and so forth. And uh, so you would transport the Marines yeah. from a bigger ship. Like, were you assigned to a convoy or a big destroyer, or <coughs> from the, from there? Uh, I think we went. We, um, you know, tr sort of training them because some of them are probably recruits too. You know, and uh, then we went to an island called Ulithi. Called what? Ulithi, U-L-I-T-H-I. Something I'm not spelling it right. Ulithi. Uh, well, how that, long were you where, at Guadalcanal? <coughs> probably a month. And did you stay on board the ship the whole time you were there, or did you live on the island? Oh, uh, we we got permission to go around the island. You know, just. Not, not the whole island, just, it rained every day there. When you went on shore to the island, what did you see from the remnants of the battle? <coughs> you, you couldn't see that. <coughs> you couldn't see a heck of a lot. <coughs> you, you might see a, the Japanese there or something. I don't know, I don't know if they <coughs> were, um, whether they bury them or what. I kind of forget for a long time. And then when you went to that other island, Ulita, what it was it? Ulithi, U-L-I-T-H-A, I, I can't spell U -L -I -T -H -A, it. U-L-I-T-H-A, Ulitha? Ulitha, I think it's I on the end. I think Ulitha? And then all the, a lot of ships um, went there to put uh, <coughs> uh, aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, they all like lined up there. Oh, so Ulitha was probably, was that a pretty big island? 
I don't think I don't think it was too too big. But so that's where a whole the ships. Uh, all the ships now. Yeah. Your LCT. Were you on an LCT still? Did yeah. you stay on that LCT for the entire war? <clears throat> Almost. Uh, then coming home, uh, they um. Well, well, actually, when coming home, they put our LCT on top of the 451, and and then the, what the, what they <clears throat> they put us down there. I was part of the crew of the 451. Oh, when you were at Ulitha and you were, had your LCT, what? Were you assigned to any of the bigger ships, or was your duty to help anybody, any of the ships that was in that whole group? <clears throat> well, we went from Ulithi to Okinawa, and then we uh, circled around the whole island because they didn't want to invade it until the next day. So we went around the whole island at, at night, and <clears throat> they strafed um, our LCT, but they didn't kill anybody, yeah, the Japanese, you know, at night and in the nighttime. So you, they, 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 you got to Okinawa before we attacked it? Yes. Now, what was the job of your LCT at Okinawa? Well, I you, Was your job to bring trip, troops ashore? Not, not, not the first day. Wait a minute. Uh, we did. We took the first mar uh, Marines ashore. Not, not, uh, I, I think it was April 1st, Easter, Easter Sunday, April 1st, I believe. 1945. Well, what was that like? Um, well, the Japanese did different things. Like <clears throat> when when the Marines first went over to different places, the Japanese would meet them at the beach and try to kill them at the beach with m mortar, you know, like artillery. But when we went to Okinawa, the Japanese like went in, um, you know, way back, and they wanted to fight that way. And uh, but, uh, they had a big fight there that last night because they're pretty good fighters, the Japanese. When you would take men ashore, did you take equipment also? I think we did. We, <coughs> we took the, one of the generals. He had a big Cadillac. Yeah, okay. We took a Cadillac ashore. I forget his name. He was a. I think I think he was in the China India India uh, thing. They had had his Cadillac there. I, I, yeah. He took his Cadillac car ashore at Okinawa. Yeah, this this general I forget his name. Yeah, he took it ashore. He took it ashore. So, would, um, do you remember what it was like ferrying the troops from from the troop ships to shore at Okinawa? Um, I see the Japanese at Okinawa. <coughs> All the times they used to meet them at, you know, fight at the Marines at the beach, but the, but the Japanese decided to do a different, a di different general had a different way of fighting. And he, and he went inland, and then the Marines had an awful time <coughs> fighting inland. Yeah. So when you were bringing the troops ashore, there was no resistance right on no, the beach? No, you, you could land that. Were you under fire or in combat at all? <coughs> yeah, uh, well, we were in combat with... Uh, Airplane uh, kamikazes. All right, can you so, and this is at Okinawa. Yeah, Okinawa, and so I. Tell there's me another about island the kamikazes and, and how often that would happen. I, all, 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 all night long and, and all day long. So you were constantly <laughs> under attack by kamikazes. Yeah, yeah. One time, I think it was April 6. They, they, they told us that. <clears throat> see, I, and I said to myself, the United States must have broke the codes because they knew that 370. Kamikazes were going to attack us the next day, and I said, "How would they know unless they cracked the Japanese code?" And they did. They had these people working on the Japanese code for months, and they they, they solved it, you know. And, and, and so, anyways, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. So, um, how, so, so, how many kamikazes attacked? Well, one. That, <coughs> but they never got. They, they had. They sent 370, I think, uh, to attack us, the landing crafts and everything, but. Um, they didn't get to us because we had uh, uh, small ships, uh, n n not really ships, off the coast, maybe 60 miles out, to, to help, and they did, a lot of them sunk them, you know, and, and they helped an awful lot. And your gunner shot down one, did you, did your LCT shoot down any other kamikazes that you know of? <coughs> we were almost positive we shot two down, but 
we didn't claim it because he said, he said we weren't the only ones that were shooting at. The first one, he was the only one, he saved everybody because we were tied up to an ammunition ship with all bombs on board and we still had bombs on ours. We didn't get them all unloaded onto them. And, and, and so he, uh, he, uh, uh, he stayed on his gun, and, 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 and he, uh, where, that, where the house is, that, that's how close that, and I said, boy, I said, my body will end up in the Pacific if, if they blew up all the bombs that we still got on board, because we didn't get them all unloaded, and then the ammunition ship was all loaded with, with bombs, too. Wait, all right, so you had bombs on board, so you not only transported Troops yeah. who transported bombs, so that they could take. We, we, you know, we'd go up on the beach, and then they'd come down with trucks and take them. They take them up to the first thing the Marines do when they attack anywhere. They, 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 they secure the airfield. They take it away from the Japanese, and and then they, then they went up and and uh, bombed Japan all the time. B-29s. Yeah. All right. So the Marines were after they landed on Guadalcanal and they took the airfield. You would bring bombs to the shore, and what would they use the bombs for? <laughs> They'd bring them up to the airfield, and the B-29s would go up and bomb Japan again. Oh, so w once we took the airfield, yeah. the B-29s could land there? Yes, yes. These were the bombs used for bombing Japan? Yes, uh-huh. How long were you in the Guadalcanal area? Uh, wait a minute. <coughs> uh, no, we weren't at Guadalcanal. Well, I'm talking now at Okinawa. Not at o uh, they didn't, well, I didn't fight at Guadalcanal. Uh, this was at Okinawa? Yeah. Um, Okinawa right. and Aishima. Oh, okay. So this is the, at Okinawa they took the airfield yes. and then you brought in the bombs. How long did your LCT stay in the Okinawa area? Oh, gee, we stayed there a long time. Okay. Like months? Yeah, Okinawa and Aishima. Now, Aishima is an island near yeah. there. Yes, it is. What did you do at Aishima? That's where Ernie Pyle got killed. I think he came on our ship once. And the poor guy, he, he was over in, the, uh, in Europe, you know, all that, doing all his reporting and everything. Then he comes over there, and he got killed on Aishima. And, and he, went, he, he went, I guess, walking up on the island, and, and the Japs just machine gunned him. He was quite a re reporter, I think. So that's where he got killed on Aishima. Aishima's next to Okinawa. Did you go on shore at Aishima? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> we went from one side of the island to the other. And all we, all we took with us, I took a rifle on the other. And my friend Bill Hale, he came from Atmore, Alabama. He was a nice person. And I'll tell you something, I got a kick out of it. <coughs> Uh, in Okinawa, and this Marine comes in. The Marines always got to talk in your face. They can't talk from here to there, you know. And they come up here and they say, and don't let me catch you, catch you, um, I don't know, I don't know how to use the words, sleeping with these people. They got 10 different kinds of diseases. So my friend Bill Hale says, how many diseases did you catch, Sarge? <laughs> And he said, who said that? Who said that? My friend Bill Hale, about six, he come from Atmore, Alabama, about six foot one, six foot two. He wasn't afraid of the Marine. He said, I said it. And, and the Marine walks up, you know, they go right in your face when they talk to you. And, and, and my friend Bill Hale, he didn't back down one inch. I was glad that he, he did. He was my best friend. I went down to see him in Alabama. You know what he became? A minister. He says he got drunk. He almost got run over on the railroad track. He said, right then to there, he said he decided that <laughs> that he didn't want to get drunk anymore. He became a minister. I went down to see him. He's a minister. Wow. Wasn't that something to... Yeah. And then what he did, he, he was like a, in charge of our crew, like a, a, what would you say, like a straw boss or something like that. And so he had a whistle. He blew the whistle all the time. So the guys got tired of hearing the whistle. When he went to sleep, they took it off around his neck and threw it overboard. Because <laughs> he was always blowing the whistle. But I liked him. He was a nice person. He said, Solomon, you didn't get any mail. You can read mine. <laughs> He'd give me his mail to read. Do you remember any of the other crew members on your LCT? Yes. Who do you remember? I remember the cook. He was a good friend of mine, Thomas Quigley. <coughs> he, he was a good cook. And I remember this uh, uh, Doggerty. 
He's always drunk all the time. <coughs> so he says to me once, he says, he says, you and I are going to run down the deck and up the ramp. And the ramp's about 80 degrees like that. And he says, then we're going to jump into the ocean, we're going to go down, and we're going to fight underwater, and whoever comes up wins. <laughs> Did you do it? He's about 250 pounds. I said, if he sits on me, I hope he'll get up on the bottom of the ocean. It's 250 pounds. So I said, you know something, Doggerty? I'm, I'm younger than you. I'll give you a head start. You know? So I said, go down the deck, you know, about 50 feet. And he says, then when I say go, go, up the ramp, and, and we're both going to the ocean. So whoever comes up wins. So anyways, so he, he listens to me. He runs down, down the deck and up the deck like that. Then he falls on his butt. On the, the deck, you know, the, the, the ramp is like that. It's not like this. Well, when you drop it, it is. But when it's up, can't have the ocean water going in all the time. And so I said, go in. And he was the cook. I said, go in and get the breakfast for everybody. But he was, he was always drunk all the time. When we were at, at Solomon's Island in Maryland, we were going to go on a five-day um, crew with the soldiers and Marines. And so anyways, he was supposed to go ashore and get all the, you know, the food. So, he didn't, so they sent me to go look at him. He was knocked out from drunk. And, 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 and the wheelbarrow with the chickens were all over the ground. And the wheelbarrow was tipped <laughs> over all the chickens. Whole, whole uh, wheelbarrow full of chickens. And he's there knocked out on the, you know, from drink, drink. Oh, my. Do you remember your captain? Oh, yeah. Mean and ornery. Really? Yeah. He's the one I threw my, his helmet overboard. I, I got tired of picking it up all the time. You threw his helmet overboard? Mm -hmm. Yep. Why? Because I was... All, he, he, would, he would just throw, you know, roll all the way, then we'd roll until we got her, roll here. I said, why do I have to, oh, I said to myself, why do I have to pick up his helmet? Since I had my own helmet, and I had mine on my pillow, and so we, we had air attacks all the time, I just pick it off my pillow. He could do the same thing. Why do I have to go find it for him and hand it to him? I'm not a slave. So what did he do? He, what, he would throw it just in, in anger, or... Just no, he just wants to toss it around. Because they're officer, they think that you got to wait on him hand and foot. So he just throw his helmet anywhere. Yes, and anywhere. And they tell me to go find it and give it to him. So you threw it overboard. <laughs> yep. And you know what it did? It floated away <laughs> like a little, you know, helmet. It was like the, I said, "Oh Jesus!" I said, "If he sees that, I'm in real deep trouble." So I got a big boat hook, you know, a big thing as long as a rake, and I went over to the side and I was sunk it. So the next time he asked you to get his helmet, <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Can't find it, sir. And, and, and so then we tied up to a merchant ship, and the merchant guy comes down. He sees our skipper laying down with a, a nice, um, uh, I'm, I'm colored by anyway, a nice shirt. He says, gee, what does one of those cost? So one of our crew says, $5, it's yours. <laughs> and, so he, and so he took the shirt off so he could get a, a suntan on his bare body, the, the skipper. And so this uh, friend of mine, Tom Agnes, everybody called him Greek. He liked to be called Greek. He was Greek. But anyways, anyways, he would lend me money and I'd pay him back. Uh, but anyways, um, I lose my train of thought. So the oh, yeah. shirt, he, he sell. He says, and they got, and it's Tom Agnes, everybody called him Greek. He liked to be called Greek. He says, five dollars and it's yours. And the skipper was sleeping on a cot, you know, in the sun, get a suntan without his shirt on. So anyways, I give him five dollars. So, so he said, anybody see my shirt? And one of the guys said, strong winds at Okinawa. <laughs> like it went overboard. <laughs> they got even with him. They, so he brought six, six bottles of beer from the officer's club on the island. The, the, uh, the listed men couldn't go get beer, but he, he put it in his refrigerator. So then when he was sleeping, everybody drank all his beer. <laughs> You're terrible. You, you, you sunk his helmet, you stole his beer, you stole I his did. shirt. I don't drink. Um, I, I don't drink. But the, uh, the crew did. Did he ever find out about you sinking his helmet? <laughs> I hope he did. So then he, he, he put me on, uh, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things that I wasn't supposed to do. Wash pots and pans for months and months and months and do everything. And, and so then one time, I was up uh, 
<coughs> I, I finally asked him, I said, Gene, when are you going to let me take the semen first class? I knew I would pass it 100%. And he said, he said my father will have to pay more income tax. I'm not going to let you take it. Imagine his father's in the, uh, Iowa and, and, he, and his father's going to have to pay more income tax. So I said, why should I? You know, then I had to get even with him. <laughs> so I threw his helmet overboard. Were you ever able to take the, the class? Because you did end up as a semen first class. When were you able to take the <coughs> exam? After 18 months. He won't let, he won't let anybody, not only me, he won't let uh, the other semen uh, take, take it either. And we, we knew it. You know, we, we used to have to steer. We had to drop the anchor. We had to pull the anchor in. And I could tie all the knots. The bowline is the most best knot because it doesn't slip out. Did you ever hear of a bowline knot? Yeah, that's an excellent knot, and it doesn't slip off. Can you still tie a bow line? Oh, yeah. Probably in your sleep. <laughs> well, at least with your eyes closed. So then, anyways, finally, he lets us take this, me and this other seaman, we take the first class. He gets about $15 a month more. So anyways, I said, oh, I, I, I said, so then we had like, like four hours, like 12 to 4, you'd be on watch for anything, and then 4 to 8 and so forth. So I was way up on the tower like that. And I said, gee, this is going to be a long night. So I said, I'll shut my eyes one minute, then I'll open up the next. That lasted for about 10 minutes, and I was fast asleep. So then he comes up with a big spotlight. He shines it in my eyes. I said, what the hell are you doing? He says, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and so I said, gee, I'm semen first class for one day. <laughs> oh, yeah. You were semen first class for only one day, and you fell asleep on duty? <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, I, I said, uh, for one day, and I said, but anyways, uh, he, he, he didn't break me down to see him in certain class. So, uh, but I don't know. Uh, now, they, Jim, I know you told me that one time you fell off one deck to a... a second, uh, for the first deck. Where yeah. was this? On, on a LCT. They had a, <coughs> the, the second deck, and then, then they had the wheelhouse up there, and this so forth. And how did that happen? Oh, somebody, uh, there was like a, uh, 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 like a fence, not exactly a fence, but nobody ever fixed it. It was broken. And I didn't realize that, you know, there was nothing, there should be something, cable across it. And I just walked, oh, well, I know, it was at nighttime, and he told me, I don't know why he did that. There's a 20 millimeter here, 20 millimeter there. He says, come over here to this. What difference does it make if I'm on this 20 millimeter can or that one? And so anyways, there was no gate there, and I didn't realize it was dark. And I just walked off into space. And I said, oh boy, I'm going to hit the, uh, hit the anchor. And I said, I'll be all chopped up with the anchor, you know, the, all the wires and stuff. What happened to you? <coughs> I, I fell down, but I didn't, I, I didn't get caught in the anchor. I, I, that would have ripped me apart, I think. Did you get injured, or could you go right back on duty? I went right back on duty. I always went back on duty, except when I got I got um, I got sick from uh, uh, I was the only one that got sick on the whole ship, and I don't know why I was poisoned, you know, food poisoning. So for three weeks, I, I I couldn't eat, I couldn't do anything. So they was this at Aishima? Oh God, let me think where it was. No, it wasn't at Aishima. I know we're somewhere around Okinawa. I forget. So anyways, uh, I went. <coughs> I know, they brought me to the hospital ship. I had to climb up about 40 feet. Those hospital ships are huge. And, and, I, and I was sick, and I said, gee, I hope I don't fall 40 feet. It was a big hospital ship. And, and, and so then, then I was on the hospital ship for two days. I said, I gotta get out of here because the Japanese love to blow up a hospital ship. It lights up like a Christmas tree. At night, all lights all over. I said, I gotta get, get off of this place. They're gonna, because what the Japanese care if they kill everybody? So I told them I was all better, but I wasn't. So they let you go back to your LCT? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you went back still sick? Yeah, I was. Did you see combat while you were over in the Pacific? Every day. So you were there for many months? Yeah. And but every day you were uh, witnessing combat? Yeah, every day, night and day. We didn't get any sleep at all. And then the Japanese would come over, like I said, but a lot of times, like they say, <coughs> like, uh, they broke the code 
and they say tomorrow, April 6th, you're going to have 373 kamikazes come and attack the landing force, you know. And, uh, <coughs> but anyways, uh, and then, th then they told us that this big battleship, I think, you probably know the name of it better than me, the Japanese battleship, is a Yamaha, uh, it's, not, it, it's you know, about seven or eight letters. And the Japanese were like saving it, and it was up in, uh, in a port up there. So everything was going against them, you know, like Okinawa was lost, the Marines t uh, took the whole island. And, and so they said, they're, they're sending down the Japanese, I used to know the name of it, but Yamaha or something like that. And they said, that's coming down 60 miles and it, it wants to wipe out the landing force, which we were part of, you know. I said, they'll never make it. Our, our airplanes aren't going to let them come down 60 miles. They're going to nail them. And, and they, before that, they were saving the battleship. You know, they didn't want it to be blown. So anyways, <coughs> it, it started to come down and, and our, our Navy planes and everything, they just sunk it. But you guys are glad to hear that. Yeah, but I, I said to myself, they'll never, uh, our, our Navy's not going to let them come 60 miles down to blow up the landing force. And Jim, they, were there any casualties in your unit? No, not in our ship, no. We got straight, but nobody got hit. And oh, I know what we had to do. And then they gave us a job of taking all the leopards to the leper colony. Oh, I said, what a great... <laughs> What a great honor that is. You know, they got no fingers, no, no toes. Where was this? Around Okinawa. They rounded them all up. And they didn't want to go to the, um, uh, the they, 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 they had to drag them on board, the, the, all the lepers. You know, they had missing fingers, missing toes. And they didn't want to go to the uh, place where they held all the lepers. Where would you take them? Where was the leper colony? <coughs> it was an island, you know, maybe about 70, 80 miles away. And it was just a place for all the lepers to yeah. stay? Yeah. And they had, you know, missing fingers, missing toes. And, and so after we took them to the, where, where, the, where we were taking them, our, our, exec, our executive officer says, wash down the deck with seawater as if that's going <laughs> to, I don't know if it did it or not. And, and so after that, I fell on a, I was running across all these um, engines, because the, 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 the um, American Army Air Force and the Navy Air Force were bombing Japan so much, they wore out the motors. So we had all spare motors on our sh ship, LCT, and it was all metal, like as you know, big as this thing here, all, and it was all metal, and, and it was all wet from the rain. And I ran across it and I fell, and I had a big scar all the way down like that. But it, it went away, I don't see it there anymore. It was all the way down. It was like, like a V, you know, all Did you have to go to the hospital ship for that? <laughs> no, I went to, uh, they, they, they sent me to this, uh, it wasn't a hospital, and this the army doctor, he said, I'll sew it up for you. So he sewed it up. And, but I fell, on, I, I, I ran across all the, all the airplane engines, you know, it was all metal on top, and it was wet, and I slipped on that. And, and the, reason, the reason I slipped on it, this uh, executive officer, we used to call him Squeaky, because he was a little, <laughs> a little runt like, and I didn't call him for his face that. <laughs> but anyways, he says, he says, go up and he says, tie up that ship. I said, I'm off. I did my four hours. Get, some, you know, you're supposed to get somebody out of the sleep. It's his turn. I said, I did my turn already. And he said, no, you do it. So, so then I, I had a big, big, uh, I, I had, then I had to sew it up, a big scar there. Jim, yeah, I, can you recall any other memorable experiences from when you were over at Aishimi or Okinawa? Uh, let me think. Oh, I know. I like the little kids, and I used to throw them candy. And they, they didn't catch it. It was going to the, you know, I'd throw them candy, Hershey bars. And, and, and so we figured that we were um, loading it for the Marines, but they could spare a few. <laughs> the kids were on the island? Yeah, I like these natives? Yeah, I like the little kids. And I'd throw it, and some of them could catch it, and some of them couldn't. But they'd pick it up out of the ocean, you know. They, they, they were little kids, I don't know how old, maybe eight or nine, and, and, and they would step in the water and uh, pick it out of the water. But I liked the kids, uh, you know. If, if, and the women, just, uh, you should see them, 50 pounds of rice on their head. They'd carry it on top of their head and they'd walk with it. I said, gee, what strong woman. At least 50 pounds, they like that. And the big, big, uh, they love rice. 
Now, earlier you had told me that you were you were one of the only ones on your ship that would swim in the ocean. Yeah. Where was that? Well, Guadalcanal. And so what would you do, just for recreation? I like swimming. I and mean, I didn't swim too far. I mean, and then we, we, we had a, a, a one softball and one bat. And so we, we said, just hit the ball like grounders. One guy belts it, you know. And he was told not to do that because we only had one ball. And this was like when the war was slowing down. So anyways, he hits it way off, off of our ship and nobody's going to go in the ocean after it. So I, I went in the ocean after it. And, I was, and every time, you know, when you go in the water, the waves makes it go further and further and further all the time. Were you able to retrieve the ball? I did. <clears throat> but then they thought that I was, look, I thought I was getting tired because the ball kept going further and further. So they came and got me with the ship. Not the ship, the little LCT. Why were the other guys afraid to swim in the ocean? No, some people are afraid of water. I don't know. They're afraid of sharks, I think. Then we saw this big fish. I said, gee, what is that? And I said, is that a shark? They said, no, it's a tuna. So they got a big hook like that, you know, an awful huge shark. And they put a big piece of pork, about two or three pounds, and, 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 and the fish went, <laughs> grabbed the pork like that. I thought, I, I mean, I didn't know fish that good, but it wasn't a shark, it was a tuna. 78 pounds, they weighed them. Really? Yeah. So did they cook them up and serve him? I, I think they cooked it up for, for, for the LC, LST, not for us. <laughs> I think they did. Jim, how did you stay in touch with your family when you were overseas? I, I wrote a letter, but took my mother about two months to get a letter. And it took, it took about two months. And then she used to send, send me a box of candy. I told her not to send it. I said, first of all, what the, uh, and when you're in the on the equator, it all melts. And, 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 and they, they did give me a note and they said, we took the liberty of destroying your candy. And my friend says, yeah, I'm destroying my candy. They ate yeah. it all. <laughs> That's what he said. They ate you know, the ones that, that uh, um, handle it and forward it to us. He said, they stole it out of you, which they probably did. Did you get mail on a regular basis? No. We didn't get much mail at all. Because you're moving here, you're moving there. And what was the food like? Spam. All the time. All the time? Yeah. So you had, did you have your three meals on board your ship? Was there a dining hall? It was like a little, um, probably from, from those uh, shutters over to here, but narrower, or maybe not even half as wide. And, and, uh, we could sit down there, and this uh, Charlie Rogers, he's half Irish and half in American Indian, and he sees this big dish, and it was, and, and it was the skipper's dish, you know, all the, the best the meat and the biggest meat like that. So what do you think he does? Sits down and eats <laughs> He sits down and eats it. And our cook, I tell everybody, I tell Tom Quigley, I said, you're just trying to be cooked second class by giving him the best food and everything. I, and so all the guys were, were sort of upset, you know, that he was kowtowing because he wanted to be cooked second class instead of a third class cook. So he was just a Charlie Rogers, ate his whole thing, and he was mad. So he says, from now on, I'll eat alone, you know? So we don't care. <clears throat> so then one day he's getting lonesome. He says, send him in and I'll let him eat with me. We, we go, one at a time, we go up to the door, I'll wait, we, no way, we wouldn't sit down and eat with him. We just, Looked and saw him. He said, and you know what his nickname was? Bull Moose. Yeah, where's the Bull Moose? And we, we wouldn't eat with him. So the skipper would eat first by himself? Yeah. And then well, first, guys? first he would eat with us until somebody <laughs> ate <his> dinner. <laughs> yeah, Did you get three meals a day? Did they serve you breakfast, lunch, and supper? Uh, if there wasn't, if it, if it wasn't done. Uh, air raids. Air raids come first. Got to get on our guns. <clears throat> but what, the meals weren't that great. You know, it was just can, canned food. Oh. Did you have enough supplies when you were overseas, or were there shortages of anything? Um, well, I know everybody did. <clears throat> like, you, you wear out your clothes fast because cause you fall and you tear them on the corner, this and that. And, and so uh, <clears throat> we opened some of the other ones and they were like marine dungarees. And 
So we, we didn't have any store. We would buy them if we could, but there was no store to buy them. So we just uh, had to have something, and, and we took these uh, dungarees like the Marines had. They didn't care. They were nice people. Did you have enough ammunition and food? I think so, yeah. How did you cope with the stress? It had to be stressful to be in combat every day and, and get yeah. attacked by kamikazes. So how did you deal with that? I said, well, if I get killed, I get killed. That's part of the part of the ball game. So I said, uh, I know my mother would feel bad, but what can you do? And then I said, well, all those bombs, 262 bombs, that's 1,000 pound bombs, that's 262 tons. I said, if that ever, if a kamikaze ever hits that, I said, I'll end up in the Atlantic Ocean. You know, 262 tons of bombs. And, and of course, they, 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 the Japanese aren't dumb. They can see all the bombs sitting on our deck. But we were lucky to be able to shoot them down. Did you do anything special for good luck? No. Well, I said prayers. <coughs> what did you do for entertainment, Jim? I know you said you had one bat and one ball, so you played baseball on board. Yeah. What other things did you do for entertainment? Uh, let me think. Well, we got to Honolulu. I walked around Honolulu, and most of our guys got drunk. <laughs> I did. I don't drink. But I like walking around Honolulu. It was nice. The weather was nice, and the palm trees and everything. Did you do anything else on board ship for entertainment? Well, <coughs> well the guys like when, when for, it took 18 months before we saw a white woman. So some of the white nurses come on board, and this one guy, oh, I forget his name now, and, and he helped the nurse over the. He said, "I'll never wash my hand again." She touched my hand. <laughs> she again. She got. Out of that. Did you see any USO shows or have any entertainers no, while you were overseas? No, nothing. Did you go on any kind of leave or R and R? <coughs> no, I don't think I don't think they would give it to us. I would have liked to have gone to Australia. I heard that's a nice place. I was hoping that we would get, get there, but we didn't. So you never had any leave when you were overseas? No. But well, I could say I, I would like to have gone to Australia. I heard they're nice people. But I said to myself, <coughs> one time I, uh, I was on my machine gun and the uh, planes were coming this way and I said, I, 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 I said, I, I have to shoot them down. And I said, if I shoot them down, he's gonna fall right on top of me because he, you know, like that. And I, and I said, well, is it fair for me to not shoot him down when, when he's so close to me? And then I said, if he gets over past me, there's a sh uh, LCT, you know, and I said, they're going to kill them. And I said, well, why, why shouldn't I die instead of them? Because I have the opportunity to try to kill them, you know. And, and then they, they, they told us, like, on the invasion, they said, uh, the Japanese have uh, suicide swimmers, and they have a bomb that they'll stick on your ship like putty, and, and they'll just, and, they'll pull, and they can, uh, they can um, uh, detone it with a, I'm not saying the right word. You know, they could um, blow it up like that. And and and, the, and this officer, not, not on our ship, he was like, had a, you know, a bigger rate than our skipper. And he said, oh, any of those people, he says, you just kill them. And he said, and they're, they're supposed to know the code. Like, like if they come over to our ship, like, like we would go like this, and then they're supposed to go like that, and we're supposed to go like that. And these guys, they forgot what the what the code was, you know. And they says, "Kill him!" I said, "I'm not gonna kill somebody like that." And so we had these these guys. They looked like Japanese. They had a little little like a rowboat, and there was one of them like like he was hiding under the canvas. And I had my Tommy gun because Skipper gave me a 22. I said, "That's a big help, a 22 caliber. That's gonna do nothing." <coughs> so he gave me a Tommy gun, and I, I Tommy gun. I just pointed it down because I don't want to uh, make a mistake, you know. And I pointed it down. And these guys said, we want to tie up. I said, stay right where you are. Don't come any closer. And they, 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 were, they were Mexican, and they looked like Japanese. They had that you know, the dark yellowish skin. And I said, don't come any closer. Just stay right where you are. And I didn't point my guy. I said, I had a Tommy gun. I pointed it down in case it went off accidentally. So they said, we want to tie up. I said, all right, come a little closer. 
and, uh, and, uh, and so we got him on board to sleep overnight, and then they had to go in the morning because we have other things to do. They were Mexican kids, not kids, you know, 21, 22, whatever. Well, when you had that opportunity to shoot down the kamikazes, did you shoot it down? I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, uh, let me see how I did get shot down. Uh, if I shot it down, I think it's going to fall right on top of it. So you, can, so you let it go? No, no, I didn't. I shot at it, but I, I don't think I hit it. Oh. It's kind of hard because, you know what they do? He immediately, I, I didn't, I didn't want to shoot him until he was right, like, just like that light, you know? Yeah. And then what he did was, he turned to the, to the left and, and, and he went right after our American plane. And I didn't want to shoot because I might, I might hit the American plane. And, and so I was, uh, Anyway, and then I saw about seven of our own ships, not sh not ships, airplanes, get shot down by our own own, own ships. And I said, that's awful. You know what they're, their eyes are bopping out of their head, they're so afraid. And, and they, um, they, 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 you know, they're so afraid and, and, and they're killing our own men. They're killing, like this, <clears throat> the first day of the uh, invasion, this um, uh, Navy, uh, it can be a fighter plane because there's three. There's a radio man, a gunner, and the pilot. Three guys on the ship. So they went over us, and our skipper John O'Brien from Springfield, Massachusetts. He says, "You don't shoot until I tell you to shoot," and we follow the orders. And these other clowns, as soon as it went over us, we didn't shoot one bullet at them because, you know, we do what we're told. And they start shooting at it, and 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 the guys are burning. The, the, the airplane caught on fire. There's a pilot. A gunner, you know, a machine gunner, and, and it was our own men. Yeah, and they and they killed them. They, they burned and everything. They suffered. Imagine that, because they're so afraid. That's what they did. They, but this wasn't on your LCT. Was this a different LCT? Uh, Who shot them? Oh down? no, nobody on our LC, LCT. We do what we did with the, this this um, man from Springfield, John O'Brien. He said, and we followed him. He said, you don't shoot until I tell you to. And, and he, he knew it was our own plane because you know, he's been in the service a long time. But these other guys, <clears throat> right, you know, close to us, as soon as he went over our plane, our, our ship, they, they killed him. And they caught on fire and everything. I, I said, what a, what a terrible thing. What are they going to tell them about? You know what they say? Killed in enemy action or something like that. They don't tell them that. Our own. <clears throat> and another time, this uh, a, a ship from Sweden, they had big guns on like that, and this Navy plane uh, was um, uh, 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 what do they call it? Uh, airplane with just one, one pilot, and he he, he had a, a fighter plane, and he went over, and, he, and, he, and these people on the uh, Swedish ship, two big shots from the big a big cannon, and it blew the wings off of the plane and killed the pilot. The wings just, you know, and, and it, uh, the the <coughs> the, the shells didn't hit hit the wing, but just the uh, uh, what do you call it, the concussion or whatever. The concussion from yeah. the blast. Yeah, but they they didn't, they didn't shoot it. I mean, they they, they didn't hit it. They, they shot two shots at it, and just the, just the. Why did they fire at the American plane? They, they didn't they, know. They they don't care. They, 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 they don't care. It was a Swedish ship, the Swedish flag and everything. I said, what 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 nice guys they have for for. Uh, uh, helping you supposedly, and they killed the, uh, the guy for nothing. And that's awful, I think, to kill your own uh, people. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Uh, um, any funny things happened other than you throwing the captain's <laughs> helmet in the ocean? And then the, uh, one of the other guys sold his shirt to somebody on the merchant ship. He said, what does that cost? He says, five dollars and it's yours. <laughs> so I scared I can tell, anybody see my shirt? And one guy says, it's a strong winds out here. <laughs> so they, they sold his shirt. Were there any other funny things you can remember? Well, every time this one guy come back from, like in Honolulu, he, he'd be drunk and he'd just say, Victim of circumstances, victim of circumstances. <laughs> what did you think of your fellow seaman? I, 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 he, and I thought the skipper didn't like me. He said, I have the authority 
to send you to um, officer's training, you'd be officer. I said, I don't want to be officer. I said, I'd like to be with my crew, you know? And he said, well, he said, he said, I have the authority to send you back to Honolulu, and, and he's a, a school there for making you know, officer. I said, no, I'm a senior, senior, I don't want to be an officer. You didn't want to be an officer? No. no not, no, not guys like him. So what did you, what did you think of the officers? Was he typical of the Navy officers? No, there were some good ones, like John O'Brien, he was a good, he was a, now, John O'Brien was another skipper you had. Yeah, he was good. He, he um, what did he do? Oh, what did he do? He, uh, I, I stopped and think. Oh, I know what he was. He was a regular Navy man, Chief Boatswain, and then, and then he was in the Navy so long they made him an officer. But he, he was, a, you know, a, a real straight arrow. You, you know, he, he he, he, he just was a, a good person, you know, you have to, just like if you have a bad boss, where, where we, I had a bad boss in the post office, you know, miserable guy, Frank O'Brien, he was terrible. I, I, I didn't like him, and I, and I, I guess I let him know it. And he would just, the, the carriers would come back, and he'd take the letters that they picked up, and he'd go like this, this, this. I said, gee, you know, he, he's getting big pay for doing what? Yeah, I, the machine does that. Well, was was the, um, John O'Brien your second skipper or your first one? No, he wasn't the first one. The first one was well, Parker. His name was Parker. That he was the to, one you didn't like that no. he threw his helmet over? Yeah. How long was he the skipper? <coughs> I, I, tell, I, he, I don't think he wanted to go home. I, I got a radio message that if, um, if you were out overseas for 18 months or something like that. I told him, I said, go ahead. I said, go ahead home. I said, no, no, I, I said, that's you, that's you, go ahead. <laughs> so, oh, so his time was up and he could go back home and yeah. so Mr. O'Brien replaced him. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and then we had another good one too. He, he, he replaced, I, I skip, I forget his name. He, he was, you know, somebody about 27 or 28. But he, he was a, I skipper, he, he, he wasn't a good skipper because you know what he did? He couldn't even, uh, maneuver our boat and we smashed into the, um, uh, what do you call a freighter, and I, and I ramp up right to the bottom of the ocean. So then, 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 then we were going to invade Japan and we didn't even have a ramp. You know, the, the big ramp in front. Yeah, the ramp that goes down yeah. and you unload. It. When, when, so when you hit the freighter, that got broken? And yeah, it went, broken yeah it went right to the bottom of the ocean, yeah. And you were going to continue with the invasion with no ramp? Well, the invasion was already uh, already done. So. But, but he, 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 you know how some people can't drive a car, they, they can't back up, or they yeah. can't do this? He, 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 bumped, he bumped the ship, and you're not supposed to bump, bump a ship that was supposed to unload or bombs or whatever. But that's the way it is. Jim, you were a radio operator on there, and were you the only radio operator on I the thought, I thought most of the guys on the, it was, it, it, they, they, they didn't use any code any, anymore. We had, we had a, I had a thing that I could use code, you know, it was a little, uh, you, you've seen them, you, you, you used to push them down, dot, dash, dot, dot. The little keys, yeah. like that, you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had what, like that, <clears throat> but we didn't use them, they, they, they didn't use them anymore. Well, what did you use? How did you communicate? It was all, it was all voice. So, so, if you were only on for a four hour shift and then off for four hours, who, who would be the radio operator when you were off duty? Uh, I, I, I thought the guys, how was this? If, 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 you, if you're not doing the code, it's easy, they just talk, you know. So they would man the radio? Yes, yeah. um, I couldn't be there 24 hours a day. Right. So. Where was the radio tower? So it, it was in the uh, wheelhouse where, the, where you, uh, you have the, the, you can steer. And then, then you have the, the uh, motors, you put it into gear, and then you can go fast or slow. So you were very close to the skipper. So, um, if you got a message, you could immediately relay that Yeah, well, I'd have to climb down the ladder and give it to him. Where did you go after you left Aishima? Aishima? Well, <coughs> we got, um, Letters from the high command that says that 
<coughs> we're going to be either the first or the second wave uh, to invade Japan, our, our LCT, we got a big letter. So I said, well, that's good because at least I know what, what's going to happen, where if we have some recruit that, you know, doesn't n know what to do or whatever. So I said, I, I, I didn't mind. I said, I, So you were prepared to invade Japan? Yeah, we were. They, they, they picked it, they told us, they said, you, you, are, you got it in a, in a letter, you know, an official letter. I said, you are going to be either the first wave to, to um, <coughs> you know, fight in, in Japan, or you're going to be the second, one or the other, first or second. I said, well, that's okay, because at least I know what to expect. I said, I don't want some guy just coming out of boot camp to go over there and he will know. And then what happened? The war ended? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you were when you heard that the war ended? It, it came over our radio. That so, Japan had surrendered? Yes. What uh -huh. was the reaction of the crew? Um, I guess they were ready to go home. And so, uh, but we didn't go home. I didn't go home for a year later because they sent all the soldiers from uh, Europe over there to help with the invasion of, of, of Japan itself. And so we had to do that. We had to unload uh, the, tra the transports that came over with the soldiers. And their biggest complaint was <coughs> the Navy gave the skippers of these merchant ships money to f feed the soldiers and everything that, that would and, and they, they said that he gave them the rottenest food and everything. They were so mad, the soldiers, they said, the captain, you know, he got money to give them good food and he didn't. So, even when Japan surrendered and the war was over, how long did you have to stay overseas at Ayashima? A year, a year. You stayed over there for a year? Yeah. What did you do during that year? <coughs> we, uh, we, um, oh, I know what we did. We took about 500 prisoners onto the LCT, and all they had was <coughs> one army guard on this, um, on, to on top of the, uh, where the, oh, I thought there's one place where we slept, and then another place where the two officers slept. And, and the, uh, oh God, I, I, I lose my train of thought. Where did you put the prisoners? Out on the deck. And where did you take them? We took them to, uh, um, uh, on, the, on the ship, not a battleship or anything, it was like a, a transport. And I don't know what they do with them, whether they took them to prison or took them to a, back to Japan, I don't know what they do with them. Did you have to guard the prisoners? All they had was two army guards. I said, that's not enough for about 500 guys, because we had a Tommy gun in the men's room, because if you have to go to the men's room, you gotta let them go. You don't want them to run all over. And, and, and so I said, we had, I, said that, I said to myself, that's not a good place to keep a Tommy gun. Then we had another Tommy gun. It's a, um, you know, to hold about 40 or 50 bullets. We had another one up in the wheelhouse. And those guys could climb up there because you can't watch them all the time. I didn't think that was... And all they had was one soldier on this side and one soldier on that side. That's all to guard all those, all those Japanese prisoners. They're but the they ones didn't that, give you any problem? No, they didn't. Maybe they were glad to get out of the war, alive anyway. What kind of duty did you do? Did you stay on board your LCT at Aishima once the war was over for that year, or did you go someplace else? Did you actually go to Japan? We, we, I would have liked to have gone there. We, uh, what did we do? Um, well, I know we had to take the lepers to the leper colony. And then no fingers, no, no toes and everything. So you did that. Um, after your year, after the war ended, then when did you hear that you were going to go home to the United States? Uh, we, we, we still, they had us taken the uh, army uh, ashore off, off of the transports and everything. But I thought there was no sense that if the war is over, you can't, what are you going to invade them for? But actually, I, I think they sent uh, ships up to uh, Japan when they surrendered. But they didn't expect it, and, and the Japanese didn't, didn't do anything tricky or anything. When you got your orders to go back home, where did you go? Well, they probably loaded your LCT back on they the LST. They did, yeah. They picked it up at a big rate. How long did it take you to get back across the ocean? <clears throat> well, we started out at a good speed, then the motor broke down. And so we were going to go to San Francisco. I said, gee, 
I'd like to go to San Francisco over the bridge and everything. We broke down and, and we ended up <laughs> down in San Pedro. You know, the, the motor conked out on uh, 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 the LST that we were on. So we ended up with San Pedro. And where'd you go from there? Did you have to wait until they fixed the motor? I think so. And then no, no, well, wait a minute. Oh, oh I know. I know. Uh, we stayed there for a while. I went on liberty to look around San Francisco. Some of the guys went to Mexico, but I didn't want to go to Mexico. And, and then uh, I took a train back to New York, to uh, the Rito Beach, Long Island, and went there to the, they wanted to uh, us re-enlist, but my mother wanted me to come home, so. So they just sent you to Lido Beach, Long Island, yeah. that the processing center to just yeah. discharge you from there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got discharged from Lido Beach, um, I believe that was 1946, <coughs> it was, May of 1946. Yeah. What did you do in the days immediately following your discharge? Um, well, I went home. You went home to Hartford, Connecticut? Yeah, yes. Then what did you do? Uh, I went back to work in the post office. Oh, you had already been working in the post yeah. office before mm -hmm. the war? Yeah. So they, you went back to your same job at the same post office? Uh, they wanted me to be a clerk. I don't want to be a clerk. I want to be a carrier out in the, you know, carrier is better. You see people, you talk to them. I like that. And so that's what you did? Yeah. And I know that you went on to work for the post office for your entire career. How many years were you with the post office, Jim? They said 38. 38 years, wow. Yeah. I was a boss. Did you go back to school at all on the GI Bill? You know something? I took the test for Central Connecticut. I got a good, good mark. And and you didn't go? I wanted to go. I would like to have gone there. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? Well, my friend Bill Hale. And you stayed in touch with him? I, I, him and me were going to go over in a merchant marine over to Ireland or England or all that. And, he, and he, uh, he got sick. And he, he, uh, he became a minister then. Oh, and that's then, the fellow. Yeah. Are you still in touch with him now? No, I'm not. Did you stay in touch with any of your other buddies from the service? Oh, I went to see my uh, Tom Agnes. Everybody called him Greek. He liked being called Greek. But he, uh, he, he was a nice, oh, I know what. <laughs> I wore him out. I said, Greek, you told me you're going to show, show me how to drive. My father never had a car, you know. So he said, all right. So we, uh, like our ship, they stole one of the army jeeps. <laughs> you, know, you know, the army guys go to the movie, and our guys went up there. They're watching the movie, and they stole the jeep from them, and brought it back, brought it on our LCT. So we took that, and he said, and, and there's no uh, guardrails over there. There's all mountains and everything, and, and, and there's like a big cliff, 300 feet, and, and, and the road is like, maybe two inches on either side of the, 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 the jeep or truck that we were driving. So he was nervous as anything, you know, with me driving, because I never drove before. Where was, where was this that he taught you how to drive? Okinawa. In a stolen army jeep. Was it a, um, a clutch and everything? You had to learn how to do all that? Yeah. Wow. And, and there was no, you know, like there was cliffs and there was no railings. So he was nervous as anything. I said, Jig, you don't look like you're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to any reunions? Has your unit had any reunions? No, they haven't, no. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. no. Jim, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war? Um, I think a war isn't necessary. I think that they should try to solve everything peacefully. Why kill innocent women? And you know what the women did when we invaded there? They were throwing their babies over the cliff. They didn't want their babies to be prisoners of the United States. And then some of the women jumped over the cliff too. Did you see that? I don't, I don't was I, that before I, you got there? No, it wasn't after. I was after. I was already there, you know. 
And I don't remember whether I saw it or not, but I said, gee, that's an awful way for them to die. They jump over a big cliff about 300 feet tall, right into the ocean. That, that wasn't right. How did your military service affect your life? Um, what did you say? <laughs> he said nightmare. Did you have nightmares? I, I, I thought I had a machine gun on the back of my... Uh, I used to sleep out on the porch upstairs in the house that we lived in in Hartford. You know, it was a screened-in porch, and I slept out there half of the winter. And so I used to dream that, that the Japanese planes were attacking the house, and I had my machine gun there shooting at them in, in the back porch. But I didn't have no machine gun there, but I dreamed about it. Well, you know, nowadays they call that PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Right. How long did you have nightmares? Uh, I don't know. I I, I, uh, I I don't let it bother me or anything, but I, I don't know how long. But I, I was dreaming about it, and then I, I used to dream sometimes I was falling. I don't know why. I fell overboard, I think, more than once. You fell overboard in your dreams or in real life? Real life. I fell into the China Ocean, and I went down about 30 feet. How did that happen? Well, <clears throat> I always liked everything nice and neat. Nobody else bothered like those big hawsers that they have on that, something like that. I used to <coughs> do it right. I, it would be all uncoiled. And, uh, I would uh, like that, and I'd make a little loop, and then back there's another loop, and i get make it nice and neat, you know, that it don't look all, somebody could trip over it and you could fall into it. But I didn't trip over it. It was clear, correct? And it was wet, and I slipped and went into the ocean. Because it was wet, you know. The, it, was like this, this, it was like a, what would you call it like that? It was about that wide, and um, I fell into the ocean. I went down about 30 feet. I said, I better start pumping and get back up, or I'll keep going down. Well, that must have been pretty scary. Well, I said, but my friend Tom, 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 he said, where the hell did Sullivan go? And he looks over the side, he sees me in the ocean. So did he help get you Yeah, out? he did. He grabbed my hand, yeah. Jim, is there anything else that you can re recall about your time in the service during World War II that I haven't asked you about? Um, I, I like the, the people in Pennsylvania. They're so nice. And, and then when we were going, we went up the Mississippi River to uh, Baton Rouge and got all our ammunition. Then we come down to Baton Rouge, all the women waving, to, you know. They know where we're going. We're going over the Pacific because the ship is painted for the Pacific. The ones that are going to Europe, it's just one color. And we hit, we had um, all, all, like all, almost looked like it was going to Africa with all these different, like that. So I, I, I didn't mind. I liked the Navy and I liked the, the, I liked the people in Pennsylvania. I liked everybody, but it was uh, fun. And I wish I was more open to, uh, I don't know, talk to people and so forth, but I was just kind of bashful. One, one lady asked me on the train, she said, hey Sarah, where's the cl cl club, club, uh, I said, what is the club? I don't know what the club is, where they sell beer and whiskey and everything. And this guy says, she wants you to take her down there and buy her a beer. <laughs> so the people were nice. They waved to us when we were going through the Mississippi River out into the uh, what's that down in Mexico? Yeah. Well, that's this different ocean down there, right? What do you call that? Out in the, the Gulf? Yeah, the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, then <coughs> around there. Oh, I know. When, I like going through the Panama Canal. That was different. Going through the Panama Canal. So you went through the Panama Canal when you were leaving the country. Yes. Did you come back that way? No. We, we were supposedly we were going to go to San Francisco. I said, great, San Francisco. I, I don't think I've ever been there. And what do you think? Then your ship broke down. Yeah, it broke down. Then we ended up way down around uh, San Pedro. Well, Jim, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered yet? Uh, gee, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think um, I would like to have stayed in the Navy, but my mother wanted me home. So. And then I made it a little bit easier for her. Bought a nice 47 Chevy, 
And then I took her down to the, uh, drove her to the movies with my sister Regina. My sister Regina died, you know that. And I took her down there, then I went and picked them up. And, and, and then she wanted to see a second cousin in Torrington. And um, I took her there, I took her for, for, for and, and, and then all I, all I know, I had my 32 Chevy, and I took my father to the beach, and he's in the rumble seat. And, and, I, and I was speeding to the top of the line, I said, all of a sudden I hear her, you know, the police, I said, I'll never hear the end of this. <laughs> he's sitting in the rumble seat, and I'm going about 65, you know, to the head of the line. So when was that? When the war was over. Oh, because you had, you had learned to drive a car by then from your friend over in the... <laughs> he only gave me one lesson. Yeah. He was a nervous wreck. That was your only lesson in driving and you learned how to drive it? That well, I, I used to take it in my backyard and go back and forth, back and forth. Wow. Well, Jim, I'd like to thank you for this interview and thank you for your service oh. to our country. Oh, thank you, Eileen.